Thank you, Drew. Uh, welcome to everyone this morning in our uh, auditorium, as well as those that are watching us online. We're glad to have you with us today. Uh, for those that are online, I don't know uh, what the weather is like in your area this morning. I know exactly what it was like in our area. It was cold. Amen. Uh, we had our sunrise service this morning at 7 o'clock, 28 degrees, a slight breeze, and everyone but the preacher was cold. And, uh, but a wonderful time, a great time, 66 people at our sunrise service this morning. It was amazing, and uh, good to see that many. And then afterwards, poor uh, uh, Carol with all the, the food and Sue and everybody else that was involved in the preparation of the f food uh, that we had downstairs, a lot of faces to feed, amen, but a good time. And we're glad that you were able to be with us if you were here this morning. If not next year, just think, uh, maybe next year we can put Easter on a day that's like 70. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll plan on that. Everybody start praying now that we can get that accomplished. Amen. Uh, but it's so good to have you with us today. Uh, this is a triumphant day in the Christian faith. Uh, this is the day we look at hope and we realize that where we were looking for hope in the tomb, he's not there. That our real hope is not in a slain Christ, but our real hope is in the risen Christ. And this is an exciting day for us to come together and meet. I'm going to invite the praise team to come. And as they come, stand to your feet with me. A song that you may be somewhat familiar with. And uh, if you're not, I'm sure that you'll pick it up pretty quick. But this uh, song is a Glorious Day. And uh, if you don't know the song, look at the words because that's a great uh, music there. And hold that thought for one second. Um, can you hold that thought for one second? Okay. Excuse me. Right behind you here. I'm going to do the great disappearing act. And then I'll be right back. See if I look the same. You know, sometimes they go out and they come back in, they, they look completely different. On this morning, with so many things going on, I am glad, do I have my coat on? Okay, and uh, I'm just glad I'm fully dressed, amen? But uh, uh, the little clicker that lets us know how to sing was in the other room. I'm glad that you were patient with me. This is a great song, it's a ballad, and it starts with focusing on the death of Christ and the blackness of that event, dark. And then it moves into <clears throat> this great moment where they buried him. And then it moves into the next, they couldn't contain him. And then it moves into the next, he rose from the dead. And so each one of these verses that goes through the song tells the story of why today we are so pleased to be able to be here and sing the story. I hope that you can sing it with us and at least look at the words if you don't know the song. Let's sing together. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was Black as could be, Jesus came forth to, born of a virgin, dwelled among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and light shined among us, glory
stand before you this morning uh, just joying in being able to sing that song. Lord, thinking about what you went through for us, what great sacrifice you made for us. I look in the mirror in the morning, I don't see anything worth doing that for. When I take inventory of my thoughts over the last 24 hours, I don't find anyone worthy of such devotion and love. When I think of the challenges that I faced and how I failed in each one of those challenges, I, I don't see the value in me that you did. And so when I get to that and I see that you stretched your hands and arms out to bear my sin upon the cross, I, I find myself so unworthy of such love and devotion. And yet, Lord, that is who you are. You are the one who is not at all put off by how we look and how we act and what we've done. In fact, where sin abounded, the Bible said, grace did much more abound. You are drawn to us because of our need. And our need is to be set free from the power, the presence, and the penalty of sin. And Lord, you did that. When, when the grave was sealed and the, uh, the soldiers were placed there, Lord, you showed the greatest power that has ever been demonstrated in this earth. And you rolled the stone away and you came out. And you rose to give us an example of what you could do from our fallen nature. And we are this morning um, in awe of such wonder and such love. Thank you, Lord, for all that you are and do for us. And may today, the moments that we have, offer our praise back to you in the form of singing. And we'll thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much, ladies and uh, gentlemen. If there are children yet with us, uh, pre-K through fifth grade, uh, you can be led by, are you taking them down? Okay. Head that direction. Downstairs. Uh, if you're singing in the choir, you can go down after you sing. Okay. Is that all right? I'll save. They were going to have this. No, I'm just kidding. They will say whatever they were going to have for you. Okay. Is that good? Okay. All right. The girls came out for a sunrise service this morning. They all had their dresses on. They just looked like angels. Amen. And then I saw their dad, and then I realized that maybe they, <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding. Amen. Uh, but they, they're so beautiful today. What a blessing it was to have them. And now, <clears throat> um, as we dismiss those kids, um, I don't know if you know this song, uh, Christ Arose. It's always like a, it's a, like one of those songs that you just attack. Do you ever know how to attack a song? You, just, you think about it, is I have no power in and of myself to come up from the grave, but because of Christ, now I have that power. And I love this song because it shows the human effort that was displayed so many years ago to try to keep Jesus in the grave. And this song talks about the defiance of Jesus as he rose victorious o'er the prey. And uh, I love it. I love to be able to sing it. And you, for those that are visiting with us, I don't want you to think I'm so terribly radical. But every once in a while, I like to sing the songs loud enough so the devil can hear it. Because one day, the Bible says that the world's going to look upon him, and they're going to say, is this the one that did make the earth to tremble and did shake nations? This is it? Him? And they're going to watch the whole universe. The angels of God bound him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness in a lake of fire. He's the enemy. 
He seeks to destroy you, your family, your kids, destroy this nation, destroy this world. He thought that he had exactly what he wanted. Jesus crucified, died, and in the grave. And this song talks about all of the illusion that he had, that death could not keep his prey. I love this. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Let's sing it together. We'll remain seated because I don't want you guys to get too excited. Uh, but uh, Christ arose. Let's sing together. When I hold my hand up like this, that means keep singing the same note, okay? So I don't want to cause you to pass out or anything, but just watch this hand, all right? Here we go. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty time for his falls, he arose. Visualize it in your mind and sing it out triumphantly as we sing verse 2. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose. joy to be able to belt it out and let the devil know he is not in the grave he is up our choir comes now to sing this is the gospel
Amen. Thank you, Drew and choir, senior and juniors. Amen. Amen. What a blessing. Stand with me one more time. A familiar song, I think, to most everybody that's here. Uh, we've sung it as uh, um, so many different times. <clears throat> This one, you may need to get a little step stool and stand on when we get to the chorus. Is that when you get to the chorus, it says, He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. And then this is where you need the step stool. He lives within my heart. All right. And if you can't get up there with your step stool, you can do this. He lives within my heart, okay? So whichever way is easiest for you, but we get there. Again, this is one of those songs that we can shout the victory out that we have in Christ Jesus, and I hope that you'll join us. 220. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever man may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always Along life's narrow way, he lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. And all seated such great sports thank you and I'm sure all of hell heard us this morning he lives within our heart <clears throat> I love to tell the story 
as the songwriter wrote, more pleasant to be told. And what a joy it is to be able to be a part of the redeemed of the Lord and to know that the righteousness that I have has absolutely nothing at all to do with me. It has everything to do with him, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Our text today is found in Matthew chapter 28, and uh, we're going to read uh, down through verse 10, beginning in verse 1. And uh, each Easter, I say this is going to be the shortest sermon I ever preached and everybody said, well, what's the longest? <laughs> you know, like, uh, if that's the shortest. But uh, today, I hope that uh, I will be able to get you out in time so you can share with your family this wonderful day together. Isn't it nice to be able to see all the family come together? And I know as I look around, so many of you have invited your family. They're here today. You have to be beside yourself with almost giddy joy uh, to know that your family is with you. And uh, the luxury that we have many uh, families that are here today, their family, parts of their family have uh, suffered uh, either in illness or they've suffered in death. And to be able to have the joy of being family um, is a wonderful thing. And I appreciate you coming to support your family today if you're here. Uh, what about the flowers? Did you notice when you walked in the aroma? Uh, I came in here yesterday afternoon and I like... Like, I mean, it was just like all consuming the, the smell and how beautiful they are down here, all the, the lilies. And uh, uh, we thank uh, the flower committee brought those in. I believe they belong to different people. So if your name is not on the bottom of it, please don't take it. Uh, but uh, what a beautiful display this morning. Did someone say they go to someone that's special? Okay, then they're all mine. All right, so uh, Matthew chapter 28 and beginning in verse 1. If you didn't bring your Bible this morning, I put it on the over... Uh, head the screen so that you can see and follow along with us. It's a rather uh, a familiar passage of scripture. It begins this way, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, let me get my clicker here so I can stay up with you guys, uh, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. That would have been a sight. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they may go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. William Faulkner's novel, Sound and the Fury, tells a story about a Compson family. I believe it's not a real family. But uh, in the book, it was about this family called the Compson family. And they suffered heavily. And in this book, it talks about how each family member reacted to the suffering that they went through. Mr. Compson, we're told, put himself beyond the reach of suffering by means of a decanter of whiskey. Mrs. Compton evaded her responsibilities through a nauseating self-pity. Quentin Compson committed suicide because he just could not handle it. His brother Jason put on the armor of callousness and became bitter at life. And Sister Candace reacted irresponsibly. If you're familiar with the book, and if you're not, I'll share with you. One, only one character in the no novel, her name being Dilsey, uh, the black mammy, could stand up to the sound and the fury of life's uh, turmoil with such tenderness and courage. In the book, she was the Compson family, everything her mother or their mother should have been 
but was not. And her presence alone prevented them from sinking even deeper into a complete state of collapse. The secret in the book, as it's given to us, to Dilsey's strength came from a powerful sermon from a black preacher in St. Louis on Easter Day, 1928. This is what the preacher spoke about, and I quote, I seize the, the resurrection in the light, seize the meek Jesus saying, Thou kilt me that ye shall live again. I died that them which sees and believes shall never die. End of quote. By the time the preacher concluded that day, according to the book, Dilsey was able to see beyond the darkness of Jesus' death and see the light of the resurrection. That light not only helped her to cope with the future, but it gave her strength for every stress of everyday life. Indeed, I would say, the secret of Christian stability is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, when you consider it, the symbol of Christianity is more an empty tomb than it is a cross. The empty tomb gives meaning to the cross. Were it not for the empty tomb, we look at the cross, it would be a terrible tragedy if there had not been a resurrection. Therefore, it was not that the witness of Jesus Christ the right of those who witnessed Christ's crucifixion and burial were also the witnesses of his resurrection. According to the passage of Scripture that we read, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were the first to receive the news of the risen Lord and to encounter him. In fact, they had been at the cross, they had been there when they had laid him in the tomb, and now they received love's reward as they were the first to know the joy of the resurrection. Through their experience and their example, we were able to learn three wonderful truths from this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 28. And I'll give them to you very quickly so you can be dismissed today and enjoy your time with your family. First of all, the certainty of the resurrection. Three poofs are given to us in the text that we read concerning the resurrection. The first certainty or proof is the proof of the vacant tomb. In verse 2, where we read, it says that the angel came and rolled back the stone. In Luke's account of this visit, uh, in verse 2 and 3 of chapter 24, this is what God's Word says, they entering in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. It's interesting because not three days earlier, they had placed his body in this grave. He was totally and completely lifeless. In fact, in John chapter 19, verse 33, a soldier who saw that he looked like he was dead but wanted to make sure took a spear and ran it through his side. If he had not been dead, blood would have come out. But when he ran the spear in his side, the Bible says both blood and water came out. A sure medical uh, uh, examination would show that, that the mixture of blood and water together is that death has been realized. And this is the reason that when they broke the legs of the thief on each side of Jesus so that they would suffer the death, they came to Jesus, saw he was dead already, and didn't break his legs because crucifixion was not about dying from your injuries. Crucifixion was about suffering long and hard by trying to breathe, by pushing yourself up. When you let your legs go like this, it would collapse your lung cavity. You couldn't breathe. And so they painfully would push against the nail or the spike to their feet, try to get their breath until their nerves and their legs would start jiggling and they couldn't hold themselves anymore and they would slump down. It was intentional to make it as much suffering and as long as possible. But because the next day was a Sabbath day, a special day, a holy day in the Jewish calendar, 
at the evening, they came around to break the legs of those on the cross, Jesus and the two uh, malefactors, so that they wouldn't be still alive suffering on the Sabbath day. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already, and they didn't break his legs. I say all that to say the religious leaders were afraid someone would steal the body and begin some resurrection theory. And so even though they knew that he was dead and that the soldiers had promised that he was dead, they put him into this hole in the earth, the tomb. And they rolled the stone on the front of the tomb and they put two soldiers on each side to make sure that some resurrection theory would not evolve. And they asked Pilate to seal the stone and set the guards. And yet for all of their work, and all of their preparation, early on Sunday morning, they came to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus and found the stone rolled away and the guards laying as dead men and the tomb empty. I say to you, one of the greatest proofs of the resurrection to show the surety that it happened was the fact that the tomb was empty. They put someone in there but when they came back to find him, he was not to be found. A second proof of the certainty of the resurrection is found in verse 5 and verse 6. Here it says, the angel who came and rolled the stone back said, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. One of the proofs of the resurrection is the voice of the angel. The voice of the angel. At the ins uh, insistence of the religious leaders, as I said, Pilate made the, sh the tomb sure, according to Matthew chapter 27 and verse 66. This wasn't some fly-by-night, second-thought, odd-lots padlock <laughs> that they put on the tomb. Rome's security was the best in the world at that time. And when they put them there, it was to make sure that no one could get in or out without their approval. God knew that there would be questions when Jesus' body couldn't be found. Amen? <laughs> I mean, you go and look at the tomb and he's not there. They knew that there would be a problem. And so he dispatched the angel of the Lord. I'll say this just briefly in passing because it describes the angel of the Lord in the text. Is that of all ironies, the angel, the angel of the Lord in the Bible is Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord in the Bible is Jesus Christ. So they had Jesus in there, locked, padlocked, guarded with Roman soldiers, and he's the one who rolled the stone away. Look at what it says his countenance was like and his raiment was like. It's Jesus himself, the glorified Christ. Rolled the stone away and said to them, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. What an uh, amazing picture that's given to us there in Matthew 28. Jesus himself rolls the stone away so they can see that the tomb is empty. And so him sitting on the stone could say to them, the angel of the Lord, I know you seek Jesus was crucified. He's not here. What a wonderful thing. And this is so amazing because it was Jesus who actually rolled the stone away. And in verse 6, uh, wonderful what he says. He says, first of all, a confirmation. I know that you seek Jesus crucified, but look what he said. He's not here. <laughs> I mean, isn't that amazing? Because where were they looking? Not on the stone. They were looking inside, right? He's not here. The second thing was information. Because someone would say, well, where is he? And he said, he is risen. So he gave information. And the third one was a deliberation. I want you to just think on this is what he's saying. This is what he said. Come see the place. Don't come see him. But come see the place where the Lord lay. And when they went in there and they looked, what did they find? Everything folded and set aside. It wasn't like someone ripped the body out in the secret of night and left all the evidence behind. No, whoever took that body out of there, took time to fold everything up, leave it all tidy and nice, and did it without the stone rolling away. Pretty good, huh? 
Jesus said, if you want to know one of the certainties of the resurrection, listen to the voice of the angel who Jesus himself was, say, I know why you're here. I know what you're looking for. He is not here. He is risen. Come see the place where the Lord lay. There's a third proof of the certainty of the resurrection in our story to this morning and in our text, and it is the visit of Jesus. I mean, think of this. He goes from the stone. After he says, I know who you seek for. He's not here. Um, He's risen. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And they turn around and they run back to the disciples to say, we just went to the tomb and it's empty. And we heard an angel tell us that Jesus isn't there. And on the way to the disciples to tell them this story, guess who stands right in front of them? Verse number nine, it says, and as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them. From the angel on the stone, here he comes back in his body of, not glorified body, but his earthly body, Jesus comes, the marks of his, the, uh, the print in his hand, and he stands on the road that they're making their way back to the disciples. And this is such a beautiful, beautiful picture. I can imagine the mixed emotions and the chaotic thoughts as they ran back after seeing what they, you understand the ladies were coming to anoint a dead body. And they found an empty tomb. And to beat it, an angel that said, you're looking for somebody that isn't here. And I can only imagine what was going through their mind. Well, where is he? He's risen. What's that mean? We better go tell someone. And they run back. And on their way, all these things going through their mind. Did I, my coffee not sit with me well this morning? What, what, what's right? You know, what happened to me? Am I dreaming? Am I hallucinating? Was it too early to be out of bed? How could this be true? We, we were the ones that watched as they put him in the grave. Where did he go? Thousands of questions like this must have flooded their mind. And in the middle of all those questions, they're running back to tell the disciples, and poof, right there he is, right in front of them. The one who they had spent so many years with watching, Jesus stands before them. And in verse number nine, they see him, they hear him speak, and they touch him. The Bible says that they grabbed his feet. I mean, they laid right down on the dusty trail and grabbed a hold of his feet because where before they had questions and they had doubt, there was no doubt about what they had just seen. Jesus right in front of them. And who could do that but God? And so they fall on their face and they grab his feet and the Bible says they worshiped him there. One of the proofs of the certainty of the resurrection is the fact that Jesus himself spoke to these people. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of things that may want, you may go back and second think, did I really do that? Did I really see that? Did I really heal that? But when you touch, that is something you never, ever forget. Amen? Touch. Uh, Was it last week? It was last week, wasn't it? Everybody left. I was back here shaking hands, and I came up here, and Brooke had... When Renly right up here. It was that last week, wasn't it? And I walked up. Now, I wanted to, but I wasn't going to ask. And, I, and she just went like this. And I thought, yeah, Renly had a twin today. I came back here. I saw, we have another baby that looks just like that here. <laughs> Amen. And I held that little baby in my arm. And honestly, all week, I've remembered that. I touched that baby. There's things that you might think, I don't know if I really saw that or I really heard that. But when you touch something, you know the truth. And they touched his feet and they worshiped him. Because the only way he could be there is if in fact he was what he said he was, God wrapped in human flesh. Proofs, three proofs of the certainty of the resurrection. But there's something else from the passage that struck my attention, and that is the communication of the resurrection. The communication of the resurrection. We're about out of time, so let me hurry. That's probably the best part of the message, right? Uh, We're in a hurry. I'm about out of time. I use that every week. It really doesn't mean a whole lot, but it sounds so good. Um, But it's exciting to contemplate the resurrection. I've done it long before this morning because 
uh, preparing for this, uh, this morning's sunrise service and this service and uh, even Sunday school this morning. There's so much about the resurrection. So anticipating uh, or contemplating the resurrection is exciting. And as I look around at the different, especially the girls here today, and I see all the preparations and the plans, clothes, the dinners, and the flowers, all that, it's fun to plan and prepare for the celebration of resurrection. But the message of the resurrection is not about contemplation and it's not about celebration. The message of the resurrection is to tell, to tell. Notice what the Bible says here, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, verse 7. And in fact, notice if you would at the screen, the first is to go. That's the first command, to go. And then that's not quite just enough. Go quickly. And that's not quite enough. The next one is go quickly and tell. The, the communication of the resurrection is not for us to sit in here and just take it in and to contemplate it and say wonderful things about it. The communication of the resurrection is for you and I to take this earthen vessel called our body and go out and tell the story. That is the communication of the resurrection. If all we do is sit around in our huddles and talk about what happened, there is no value in that. The value is going out and telling someone what we now experience that we did not at one time in our life experience, and that is the communication of the resurrection is to tell the story. In fact, in Matthew chapter 28, just a few verses beyond where we are here in verse 7, in verse 19 and 20, it begins the cornerstone of the church's mission, and it says the first three words, go ye therefore, go, tell the story, tell it, tell it. I say every once in a while, and I know that some of you think I'm about half nuts, and that is, wherever you work, God's placed you there because you are skilled, but he's also placed you there as a missionary. Who will tell those people if you don't? Now, I'm not saying that you should tell your employer, thanks for hiring me as your missionary, because he's not going to like that or she's not going to like that. You do not have to quit working to be the missionary. All you have to do is tell the story. Just tell the story. Don't be ashamed of the story. I used to use opportunities when people would scoff and mock to tell the story. In fact, one day I had a three by five card and I pinned it on the front of my pocket and it said, fools make a mock at sin. Proverbs, fools make a mock at sin. People would come up to me and you could see their eyes, they'd go right down to my pocket. And you could see them read. Even if you were talking to them, they weren't listening to you because they were reading. They couldn't do two things at the same time. They would read that. And then they'd look up at me like I hadn't said a word, even though I'd done talk the whole time they were there. And they'd say, what does that mean? Oh, man, you talk about an open door. That's a wonderful opportunity. What does that mean? If someone came to me and said, you're not supposed to talk about religion at work, I said, they asked me a question. You don't want me to answer it? They asked me, what does that mean? Fools make a mock of sin. I said, uh, all sinners think sin is funny until sin comes and calls and condemns and ask for payment. Because all sin will ask for a payment. The Bible even says about sin being pleasurable for a season. But all sin requires payment. And when it comes to call, those who mock now cry. And so tell the story. It doesn't have to be an in-your-face thing. It doesn't have to be uh, hateful. It doesn't, certainly shouldn't be hateful. But everyone should tell the story. One of my favorite songs, I sing it all the time. People look at me. They do think I'm half nuts. But it, it goes, you ask me why I'm happy, so I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. And they go, what happened to him? And, uh, you know, like, did he have pizza last night or what happened to him? I mean, there's something wrong. And, uh, but it's infectious. When people hear you do that out in public, I delivered uh, product to uh, a group of people who were union tradespeople, pipe fitters. 
not your please pass the salt. There were other ways that they asked for the salt, okay? And I'm on the back of the truck pulling these products out, and I'm singing, you ask me why I'm happy, so I'll just, and they go, oh, no. What is wrong with this guy? And they mocked and they laughed. But every one of those guys on that, that squad, at some time when I'd deliver a product to me, they'd say, hey, you got a minute? I say, yeah. And they'd walk me to some place where no one could see them. They'd say, hey, my wife's real sick. Um, w- will you pray for him, for me? And I'd pray for him right there. I said, you want to pray right now? And they'd go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we make sure nobody was looking, amen. Go quickly and tell. That's the communication of the resurrection. And then lastly this morning, that's the favorite statement that my kids like whenever I'm saying, okay, you're going to listen to me because you did something wrong. And I say, and last of all, and their eyes get big around, like, okay, he's about done. And then they find out that has absolutely nothing to do with being done. All right, it's just the last thing I'm going to say. But this one here is the certification of the resurrection. It's found in verses 18 to 20, which I just alluded to. And this is kind of an interesting thing, because this is, this is what this verse says. And Jesus came and spake unto them. Now look at the three faces on the picture in front of you. And Jesus came and spake unto them. These guys look like some of the guys that I was pulling product off of that truck to to give in the union trade. I mean, any of those three you want to meet in a dark alley somewhere? This is what Jesus said to them. Jesus came and spake unto them, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whichever I've commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always until the end of the world. It's kind of interesting. This is the commissioning of the Lord's disciples. It is hard to listen to the lofty commission that Jesus gave without considering who it was the Lord was giving it to. Look at these guys again. Jesus said, okay, everything I just accomplished, it's all on you guys. Here you go. I need you to go take this out to the world. It's all on you. Take it out to the world. On these guys. I mean, just think about that if you would. Uh, These are ex-thieves. According to the scripture, filthy, mouthed, and minded tradesmen and misfits of society. All of them at one time were total messes. All of them miraculously changed by the resurrection. You say, what is it that certifies the resurrection? What is it that stamps it and says, man, it's a fact. It happened. And we we know that it happened. What is it? It's funny because from this commission that the Lord gave to his disciples, these men went throughout the world and proclaimed not only the historical account of the resurrection, but also why the resurrection was so important. We may look at them and look at the Great Commission and ask ourselves, honestly, was it very effective? Did they accomplish the task at all? Did they do all right? I would direct you in your minds to Acts chapter 17, verse 6, where it says, these 12 men turned the world upside down by the gospel which they preached. Was it effective? My goodness gracious. They changed the whole world. With what they did, they turned the world upside down. You know what's really interesting is how they did it. How God takes people who seemingly cannot and have no ability in themselves and makes them the messengers of the truth of the gospel about the resurrection. And in fact, it's interesting because over the past 2,000 years, Each successive generation that's come along of disciples has done the same thing. Each generation coming down, and we witness the continuance of the certification of the resurrection each generation that goes down. And though still there may be those who doubt 
and scoff at the certainty of the resurrection, no one can doubt the certification of the resurrection. You might say, I'm not sure that he rose, but you can't doubt that it happened and it changed his life because it remains the same today as it did over 2,000 years ago. Jesus' resurrection changes lives. The resurrection is not just about history or religion or even spring celebration. It's about the changing of lives. It's about hopelessness turned into hope. It's about unrest turned into peace. It's about failure turned into victory. Everything the gospel touches, it changes. It changes lives. You say, what's the, what is, <coughs> what's the certainty of the resurrection? Look around you here today. This is the certainty of the resurrection. Look at the younger ones that are here. We have younger, but they're downstairs with their own service. Look at the younger ones here today. You know why he's here? Because his mom and dad are here. You know why he's here? Because of her mom and dad. You know why her mom and dad's here? Because of her mom and dad. I mean, it just goes generation after generation. The certainty of the gospel may be doubted, but the certification will never be doubted. <clears throat> I never, ever take for granted when I stand here on any given Sunday morning that somewhere in the auditorium, probably downstairs because there's food, <clears throat> is Titus. He loves food. Somewhere in the auditorium is John, my middle son, and somewhere in the auditorium is Andrew, my oldest you see, this is what certifies the resurrection as being authentic. And that is that it changes lives. And my three kids are here, Brenda and ours, because my mom's here, and Brenda's dad, who's not here, but he was a pastor. And it continues over and over and over again. That's what certifies as authentic what the rapture does. The Compson's life was a picture of misery and sorrow. In the midst of their hopelessness, one lady, Dilsey, the black mammy, stood strong and victorious because she had the resurrected one in her heart. You can have peace and hope today if you let Jesus in your heart. You see, the gospel changes everything. But the real question is, is has it changed you? Because the resurrection doesn't change people by osmosis. The resurrection changes people by their acceptance of the resurrected one. Back in 1973, as a young man, I realized I was lost and without hope. And I called out to a God who I did not think had any obligation at all to hear me. My life was a mess. Not because of what someone else did, but it was a mess because of what I did. And at 33,000 feet in the air, I asked God if he could look upon me and forgive me for the mess that I had made. And overwhelmingly he said, look on the cross and see if I died for you. And then look at the tomb that it's empty so that you know that what I promise to you, I can keep. And that day at 33,000 feet in the air, I asked Jesus to come in my heart and save me. And that's exactly what he did. The gospel changes everything and it changed me. My mom couldn't hardly stand me before. And you know moms can stand about anything, all right? But the gospel changes everything. By invitation, it can change you. If you don't know Christ today, I hope, that, I hope that today would be the day that you embrace him as your personal Lord and Savior. And your life can be changed as well. Before us this morning, we have the certainty of the resurrection. We have the communication of the resurrection. And we have the certification 
lives that are changed, that Christ is no longer in the tomb, but he's alive. I hope he's your savior today as well. Father, thank you so much for our time today. These great songs that we've sung, great opportunity we've had to look into your word, see how confident we can be of what Christ did and what it does for us, his resurrection. And now I pray, Father, as we go our separate ways here in a minute, we're with family and we celebrate this day and celebrate family together. The Lord, we did not do it without knowing for sure that Christ is our Savior. Lord, today, if there's someone here who doesn't know you for sure, they can know you. And I pray that they would seek me out so I can show them from the Bible how they can know for sure. It's not about joining something. It's not about doing a certain thing. It's about calling upon you. Lord, I would be so pleased today to be able to show them from the Bible how they can know you in a real and a personal way. And I pray, Lord, that you'd encourage them to do that. And for all of us, Lord, as we leave today rejoicing in the empty tomb, help us to carry it with us through our activities all day that we might enjoy the great victory that was wrought so many years ago. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me if you would. We sing this last invitation song. This is rather a praise song than an invitation. And it's because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Let's sing it together. Sing together. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. And bless you. Have a great day. Thanks so much for coming today. And make sure you shake hands or hug at least five people before you leave. They'll appreciate it. God bless you. Have a great day.